Thanks for coming. I guess we have uh, we've never had such a huge turnout, so uh, it's going to be a great one. Uh, I wanted to introduce Bobby Williams. Uh, he's going to be our speaker tonight. Uh, unfortunately, Will May, who was the original speaker, had a family uh, family uh, thing come up, which uh, he couldn't make it, so he had to be there. But Bobby's going to take his place, and um, talking to him a few minutes ago, I think he's going to do a great job. So what I'll do is, uh, Bobby, you know, he's on this table. If you start dinner, and then we proceed along, and then we'll start the presentation at 7. So. As you can see, there's no projector, so you just have to use your imagination and he's going to do the talking, so it should be good. Thank you. What is the Waffle House Index? That's the main point of this presentation. Uh, and why does FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, utilize the index to assess damage in disaster areas? So why do they use Waffle House in the first place? Um, we'll focus a little bit on the Waffle House's unique response to disasters in partnership with the federal, state, and local agencies in addition to the first responders. Um, we'll speak about supply chain management during the storms. We will speak about how the disasters help Waffle House separate the, um, their brand name from their competitors. And then I'll mention a couple of different, uh, the, some of the experiences I've had with Waffle House when I go to the different um, areas for the storm relief. Um, after that, we'll speak about um, some of the career parts of Waffle House, some of the shopping kind of statistics about Waffle House and the career with Waffle House. Um, we'll talk about uh, any inventory questions you have about Waffle House. Um, some of the, uh, we have a, a marking system I'll go over that's pretty neat that no one really knows about but everybody wonders how we put those orders and how we are so fast on the grill but there's a secret to it uh, so you'll learn that today and then we'll talk also talk about a little bit about people supply if, um, at, at the end as well um, so the Waffle House index the Waffle House index is what FEMA uses to determine how uh, bad a storm has hit the land um, for example Hurricane Matthew recently hit um, they use what's called a, a red light system. It's a red, yellow, and green as it sounds. And the red means that the uh, storm was really, really bad, so bad that Waffle House had to close. Uh, we had to close the tent. There's pretty much no time Waffle House closed. Every, there's a rumor going around that Waffle House, we, we throw the key away because we don't ever use it. We're a 24 hour business, we operate seven days a week. And we even are open on holidays. Christmas is actually our busiest day of the year. So that's why that rumor was started is that Waffle House never closes. So if it is a red light for that storm relief, then the reason is because Waffle House is closed and something's really wrong in that area. <laughs> um, next is the yellow light. The yellow light just means that we are probably lost power. Um, and meaning a lot of places around us have lost power as well. So we're on a limited menu. Um, Waffle House, we use gas, we don't have, um, we actually use gas when we're cooking, so we can stay open. If the power is lost, we can still serve a limited menu. And, and part of the reason is because it's, it's all planned out so that we can serve people during the disaster relief and that kind of thing. Um, so if it's a yellow light, we're on limited menu. We've also probably lost power, so we're on generators, and that's the reason for that limited menu. Um, when we're on, when we lose power, we can't use the coffee makers, we can't uh, make waffles because they're plugged in to the building, um, but we can use the grills because they're gas and we can make hash browns, do like sausage biscuits, different things, and depending on how busy we get, the, limit, the menu might get even more limited based on trying the volume to get the food out to serve as many people in the community as possible and try to uh, take care of as many customers and get their lives back to some kind of normalcy. Um, and then the green means uh, basically everything's full go. The storm hit, but it's kind of passed, and we are operating on a full menu um, and serving full menu to everyone. Um, and a lot of times we'll kind of be spotty. Um, right along the coast with Hurricane Matthew, it was um, Florida closed down a lot of restaurants for a little while, and then right after the storm came, 
I know my super area vice president and a lot of other really high upper management went down to Florida and then as the storm came up, some of us other people went to Georgia and, and uh, Charleston and uh, the South Carolina coast. Um, so so it's, it's, it is really neat to the plan and the things that we have in place when something like that hits. We also have, um, along with that, uh, to, su to supply the funds, we have the first responders work with us to uh, help us get to the Waffle Houses. If we can't get there, sometimes we'll have like police escorts to different places so that we can open the Waffle House and start cleaning and getting it ready so that we can start serving the community again. So it's pretty neat. Um, talked about FEMA. Um, so some of the other responses to the disasters are we actually have uh, special trucks that have uh, like uh, gas, uh, I don't know, it's like a gas toolbox built into the back of the truck so that to, to that way we can go around to fuel the generators when the when there's limited power. Um, and it just has a nozzle right on the back of the truck and you just pull it off and fill up the generators. I, I saw one of the generators at the most recent storm um, team and the generators are probably probably up to about right here and um, it, about, I'd say as wide as from here to that wall and it, it, they're pulled on it, they're actually pulled by a trailer and it's just it's, it's wild to see the size of those things and they are loud you can't talk on the phone beside one of those generators because nobody will hear anything on either side of the phone, it's pretty amazing um, Were they cat generators? They were. They were cat generators. So where are they stored, the generators? I, mean, um, I think they're just kind of scattered around. Um, I, and I also believe we rent some as well. I don't think we own all those generators. I think we rent some of those. So. But all of the stuff is planned out ahead of time. If we, Like Hurricane Matthew, for instance, when it was down in Haiti, we knew it was coming days in advance, so we went ahead and bought up all the hotel rooms we could that were left. Um, and try to be on the front end of it uh, so that we could put our staff in the hotels and um, we because they, they right the first thing that goes to the hotels Every, everybody tries to take all the rooms uh, from Hurricane Matthew hotels were taken all the way up and you couldn't get a hotel room all the way up to Greenville yeah, right. they were taken all the way here so we had I, I had relatives down there and they come up here and they had to stay with my mother because they couldn't find a hotel anywhere so it's pretty neat um, they, yeah, they get really, it gets, it gets really busy. So we buy the hotel rooms right away, close to the coast. That way, right when the storm passes, we can get, we wake up at four in the morning, get dressed, and go into work, and start trying to open the wall houses, cleaning everything up. You don't, you just kind of never know what what you're going to find. Um, sometimes uh, you might find some of the restaurants will stay open a little more inland. And then, and they'll be on the limited menu. But when you get closer to the coast, you just never know if you might have flood damage or other things that are stopping. And, and it takes a little longer to open certain restaurants. So you just never know. Really, it's kind of a mystery what you're going to find when you come in. Um, but other than the destruction and that kind of thing, it is kind of interesting when you're on this side of it because you're. It's kind of like a, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Twister. But they all are on that little jump team and they jump up and they chase the tornado. That's kind of what we do with, uh, with the storms. So we, uh, we jump up and we kind of go, go right in after. It's pretty neat. But, um, let's see. So what happens like before the storm? Do you have like a um, set protocol that whoever's on duty, if you will, you're we we supposed to follow up? Yep, we have a set protocol for shutting down. We have pretty much a protocol for anything you can think of. Um, it starts with shutting down the restaurants. You know you're going to leave because the, dang the area is too dangerous. Then you will leave. Um, you'll go ahead and clean all the dishes, clean everything in the restaurant, even though it's probably going to get dirty anyways. We still go ahead and clean it because if it doesn't, then we can open it faster. Um, but from we have checklists for dishes. We have checklists for... Uh, and we call all of our people because the, the number one concern is how many people are leaving towns where you, you can't stay open if you don't have people to serve people. So we try to get schedules of who's staying and who's leaving because we can't force someone to stay during a dangerous situation like that. So a lot of people leave town and that's okay, but we, we go ahead and have a 
like a checklist and to know where our people are and who is accessible to come in to work when we get open and running again. Um, we also have what's called a, uh, a war room, is what we call it, and um, it's where the upper management, the uh, senior vice presidents and above in the, air, in the markets, all get in one room and they plan everything out and they're pretty much there from the start of the storm where they the point where they think it's going to hit uh i'd say four or five days out they get into this room and they start coming up with all these checklists that you, that you mentioned um and, and do all of the planning to make it easier and then the as it, it kind of trickles down through position to work that plan that they come up with um but it is definitely it's um Waffle House ranks, are like the positions are kind of ranked a little bit like the military. Um, you have, um, like the military, you know your, who your boss, uh, each step above you. Well, with Waffle House, we have, we're structured in threes. So a manager is over one restaurant, a district's over three, a division's over nine, an area vice president is over 27, and then uh, a senior vice president is over three area vice presidents. And then geography might change those numbers just a little bit, but that's the structured plan. Um, so then when, the, when that trickle-down effect comes, the executive vice president is, and the senior vice presidents come up with that plan, and then they trickle it down to make sure that plan gets executed. But yeah, that's, that's a great question, too. Um, see the, uh, but the, in the war room, they, oh, I'm sorry. And with, with Matthew being a much slower moving storm, than most. Most are kind of whoosh and they do the damage and they're out. Was, was, did that uh, cause any special issues for you? The, the fact that it was so slow moving. Secondly, well, can you kind of describe the worst restaurant that you saw in the storm? Okay, the, uh, so with it going slow, it kind of did throw us off on a time frame just a little bit uh, because I thought I was going to leave two days earlier than I ended up leaving to go down for a leave. But, um, I actually ended up, instead of leaving on Friday and going down and being able to swoop in, I ended up leaving town on Sunday um, and going down there and I, work, I ended up working three days then. Other people did leave earlier and go to Georgia. I ended up going to the South Carolina coast for this most recent storm. Um, it was hit a lot harder in Florida and uh, Georgia. I think Georgia was hit real hard because how the land is, uh, the swells, uh, Somehow, with how the wind comes and hits the um, the America, the uh, how it, somehow the swells were larger in Georgia for some reason, based on how the wind was and how the coastline is structured. Um, but yes, the, the moving, how the uh, how slow it moved did affect us and, and when we left and stuff. And it kind of threw a wrench in the plan just a little bit because typically they are faster. And what was the second? Was the second what was the worst thing that you saw? The worst thing I saw. Um, in South Carolina, it wasn't near as bad. We saw damn power lines and trees and bridges out, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, so we had to, we'd have to use, thank goodness for GPS, because if we would come in and we'd have to reroute ourselves to try to get to where we were going several times, and it took a lot longer to get where we were going. Uh, but the power lines were out everywhere because the trees, you just see the tops of trees just cut off. And you, it, it was kind of, it was very strange how, it's not like a typical tree falling over. It's just the whole, it's actually coming up out of the ground and then the whole top is just gone, which is kind of strange. Um, let me see, you see, uh, there was still a lot of flooding everywhere. And I think the flood is what hit the hardest. It wasn't like the winds were, they were kind of bad, but they weren't as bad as the, the storm surge. Um, but the flooding, it just stops from getting anywhere and just causes like a lot of damage. Uh, we had sheds and stuff that were completely flooded and everything in them kind of ruined because I mean with all the preparation and planning you that's lower on the checklist so that that stuff just was kind of ruined but uh, one of the funny stories is my area vice president who's a pretty proper type of guy he was he was over uh, and we were putting a we have the grease traps and we have the tops on the grease traps when the storm blew it off and we went to the storm where, where it was flooded really bad and the water had receded so we could get there again and he opens up the top of that thing to put it back on the grease trap and a big turtle this big falls out on his foot and he's jumping around and it, it was kind of it was just funny because he didn't know what it was he, he's not scared of a turtle but it looked like he was so i was laughing <laughs> and i took a picture of him and he's just running around and i'm like it's just a turtle man <laughs> so that was pretty funny um 
And then I also have a picture of the same area vice president. He's, it, 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 it's even funnier when you know this guy because he's a, he's a really sharp guy, but he, if you know him, his, his hair is never out of place. He's one of those type of guys, and he, he, um, I, I got a picture of him on top of a dumpster jumping down the trash. <laughs> so, because it, the dump was, the trash pickup didn't come because of the storm. So he was inside of the dumpster, jumping up on top of it, trying to crush it down so he could fit more in it. <laughs> so that was pretty funny as well. Um, do you have, is it common, like, say there's something going to happen in, on the shore, like, do you bring employees from, like, Tennessee to say, hey, you know, does anybody want to volunteer and get out and work down there? We do, and that's a lot of the way we supply people. Um, because a lot of our people sometimes will leave, um, so we, we ask for volunteers everywhere, and that's kind of how I got involved. Cause from Greenville, we weren't we were, the only way we were affected is because our sales went to number one in the company because of everybody, all the traffic, all the traffic. We were really really busy in here in Greenville because everybody leaving Charleston had to come up this way. So we ended up being number one in the company in sales for Hurricane Matthew during that period. Um, and we were already good in sales, but we weren't. We weren't. We were probably a lot lower than number one. <laughs> we do. We have a lot of people. A lot of people enjoy it. Like they really get a thrill out of it because, it, like I said, it's kind of like the they picture the Twister movie type of deal. But they they also like the volume. A lot of our grill operators, they get. Uh, there's actually online. They can go online and see how much, how many dollars they cooked. So we have hourly associates. I'm in management. I've been here seven years, and I've, I work more hours than all of them. And they still have. They, they're in the highest volume situation, so they get a thrill on how much they cooked and how much they did on that shift. Um, a normal shift at Waffle House on a busy weekend is maybe two thousand dollars. Is kind of a busy shift, and we, we we can do all the way up to three thousand at some stores on a busy shift. Now, mind you, a lot of that's credit cards. So there's not a lot of cash inside of the store. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, but they get a thrill on that. And um, so when we go down for that storm relief, we have one store down there, and one day they ended up doing $9,000 just on hash browns and sausage biscuits. <laughs> that's on a limited menu. So they get a thrill on saying, oh, I did this much. And they get really into it and energetic about it. And it's and that's one of the ways you can motivate them is say, hey, you're going to do some volume you haven't seen before, and they'll get so, all the time. So yeah, they can actually get paid a percentage of their sales. So our grill operators, they make the lowest paid ones make nine fifty an hour plus bonuses, and the highest paid ones make thirteen an hour plus bonuses. So the, the really good ones are excited because they're making a percent bonus on nine thousand dollars. So it's pretty neat. Let me let me ask you. What was the reason that Waffle House decided to have this kind of a supply chain network? What prompted them to kind of foresee and do the what is for you know, these kind of scenarios? So right. one, there, there are several reasons. One of the reasons is because it helps the community get back to a little bit of the normalcy. They need to uh, be able to earn money and fix the problems that happen in their house and that kind of thing. Um, Another reason is because we at Waffle House does not advertise. I don't know, when was the last time any of you in this room have seen a Waffle House commercial on TV? There isn't one I, I, that I know of that, that we don't advertise on TV. I, I have seen, in my seven years, I think I've heard two radio commercials because they're pretty cheap and they tried it. But um, overall, we don't really spend a lot of money on advertising, so this is also a great opportunity for brand recognition. Um, Waffle House, they were pretty much the only people to stay open and or try to get back open if it's really bad. Um, so it's kind of a, it's a, more for the brand and advertising, it, it helps a lot as well. So it was more from a community base that if something goes wrong, at least there's a place that someone can come. Get at least someone can and, and come and get a warm, hot meal. Because um, like we said earlier, a lot of people lose power, so they have a place that they can count on and rely on to come and get something to eat. Yeah, so you plan for the event itself, but how does Waffle House plan for the potential exponential growth of customers, specifically around making sure they have enough food for that, for that growth? Uh, we, when we can see it, we order special trucks, and like we said, I, I, 
I said earlier the first responders are willing to help us and get us to the restaurants. But the same that comes with like the food vendors, that kind of thing. We work with the state and we work with the local uh, government agencies, that kind of thing, so that the uh, vendors will give us more food at that time. And, and it's, we can kind of put a little last minute orders in. We, all, we do have it delivered to one restaurant usually to help them as well. So we kind of work as a team. They don't take it to all of our restaurants like they typically would. But when we order more food, they bring it to one specific location, and then we help this person to the restaurants. But that's a great question too. Um, but yeah, it, people at the, uh, the at the state level and the, um, the government and the law enforcement, those people all work with us to help to help with the storm and help the community. Let's see. Um, Excuse me. Oh, sure, I'm sorry. Yeah, by the way, my daughter loved Waffle House. She, had, she got a lot of spankings when she was small because she always wanted to stop at the Waffle House when we were driving. So, but, uh, <laughs> how far do you go north? You don't go, you go for East Washington or? We're mainly a southeast company, but we do have, I know we're growing, actually, we're growing pretty fast in Ohio right now. Um, we're going pretty quick in Ohio. It was franchised, but we are, a lot of people are, during these tough times, so see, we're debt free, so that helps us. So a lot of people are during these tough times and the recession and that kind of thing, they are trying to sell to franchises and then they just kind of collect their money based on the, the cost of the franchise, using the brand name. With us, we we're at, <coughs> excuse me, we are actually uh, going the opposite direction since we're debt free. When the franchises don't grow or do what and follow their contract, we actually buy back um, the franchise. That way, we can keep the standards going up to par. And when we do offer franchises to people, we have um, area vice presidents and above. Part of their oper uh, part of their job duties are to go check on the franchises, franchisees, and make sure they are following things and doing things the right way, so that we can try to maintain our standards. Because one of the problems with franchisees in a lot of places, I'm not going to say everywhere, but a lot of places, is the standards drop a little bit. Yeah, I think it, it would be interesting if you say how you select the franchisee. It's not by like getting one that has money to be a franchisee for local houses as well, right? Also, there is another rule with our franchisees. Um, and you raise up a great, great point. Um, to be a franchisee with Waffle House, you have to have already been a unit manager and a district manager for or above for at least three years. So you have to have, have multiple restaurants for at least three years to buy into the franchisee. Um, I couldn't do that. I, if, I, if I chose to, I've been here long enough to do that if I, if I want to use my Waffle House stock. I've been here seven years. I'll tell you, I have 165000 in retirement already, so it's a, it's a really great company. I choose to stay with corporate because... When I go, when you're a franchisee and you get a phone call, it, just, it, it directly affects you. When I go on vacation, I have other people run my vacation and I, my retirement's still growing fast enough where I still feel like an owner. I'm a, I am, I'm a stockholder. So um, it's a private company, so you have to buy into the stock to, to own something. What fraction of the Waffle Houses that are out there are, are corporate owned and what fraction are franchisees? Um, let's see, there are around 1,900 or so Waffle Houses. It's hard to know because we actually open a new Waffle House every six days. Um, so I don't have an exact number for you, but we're a debt free company. So we open a new restaurant every six days and we pay cash to do it. Um, so the, but the fraction there, I would say out of those 1,900, we may have around 500 franchisees. Is the rest of the four to 500? And the balance are corporate now. And the rest are corporate. What's your policy on the proximity from one Waffle House to the next? Like we have, and that's a great question, especially for <laughs> <in> this room. <laughs> that's a great question for this room because it, 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 a lot of the reason is because we thrive off of each other um, with the inventory and that kind of thing. If if a Waffle House runs out of supplies, we can run right to another Waffle House to get supplies. So literally. It, literally. It, we literally <laughs> run. Sometimes they're across the street from each other. <laughs> Especially in Georgia. Is there a policy note that says, hey, you know. There's not a strict policy, but the, the rule of thumb, from what I've seen, is if you, oh, we're headquartered in North Cross, Georgia. So if you, I don't know if you guys, any of you are hunters, but we're, we're down in the south, so I'm going to use that analogy. So if, if you shoot, uh, say you shoot birdshot out of a shotgun, 
and you shoot a map, it would kind of speckle out to where, say you're aiming right here, there would be dots everywhere around this part right here, and then it would kind of scatter a little bit more as you get further away from the center trajectory. But there would be a whole lot of dots right there in the center, and that's kind of how it is with Atlanta. So if you took a map and shot Georgia, <laughs> then that's a great way to describe how we're located. We have a 200, we have over 250 wall houses in Atlanta alone, not Georgia, Atlanta, and then dispersed from there. And then we're also growing really fast in Florida. Um, I'd say Florida's growing really fast, and then down in like the, um, the Alabama area, Tennessee's growing really fast, and Ohio's growing really fast as well. Any other questions? So logistics wise, does Waffle House own their own fleet of trucks, and especially for emergency times? Do you all have like a small dedicated fleet that tries? No, we don't have a, well, I like the only trucks we really have that are special are the ones that have the gas for the generators and stuff. Um, we actually use US Foods. Um, those are the main suppliers we use. And then um, we have a Waffle House catering, huge like RV, uh, it's just like a catering truck, um, and we use that at just special events. Um, we had, for the last South Carolina Clemson game, we had it come down with Clemson 1, which is a pain because I was South Carolina, but <laughs> I had to go and get all the, a lot of the people from the Columbia area, they had to come down and help us, and we had the food truck come in town for a special event, and we served uh, on Wednesday. After that game, we served uh, free hash browns and free uh, coffee and free waffles to everybody that came through that day. It was pretty neat, but we had the food truck serving food and inside the serving free food, so it was pretty neat. And there was and there was actually a line wrapped all the way around the building, like <laughs> zigzagging, and it was pretty amazing. But another question. So, like I told you earlier, I've I do breakfast when I travel at Waffle House. Okay. Uh, it's by default, but uh, and I like it. <laughs> so I always question is they don't write anything down, and then when it gets busy, they just shout out the orders, and you know the person on the grill makes it, and they, they always have it right. So what's the secret behind that? The secret behind that is we do not remember the orders. We actually <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the secret, it's a huge secret. We actually, uh, the waitress takes the orders down um, on their ticket, and they call the orders to the grill operator, and as they uh, call those orders, we have one, we usually, if we're really busy, we have one grill operator over there cooking meats, eggs, that kind of thing. The other grill operator, if you'll watch him, he looks like an octopus, because he's sitting there grabbing stuff, putting them on the plates. Well, when he does that, he, for an example, if he grabs a jelly packet and puts it on the plate, depending on where, it, depending on, if you act like this is the plate, he grabs a jelly packet, say the plate's like this, but I'm going to hold it up so you guys can see it. If he puts a jelly packet down here at the bottom of the plate, then that means the order of the eggs are cooked scrambled. If it's in the middle of the plate, that means the cook or eggs are over medium. If it's over to the left in the center, it's over light. Over here is over well. Up is up. Makes sense, right? And um, so that kind of tells us what we're cooking. And then grits automatically come with every order. So we automatically know with that jelly packet, we automatically know grits are on the other side of the plate. And then toast is complimentary as well. So, but you can change your order by, because grits or hash browns you can substitute. So if they say it's a plate, that means hash browns instead of grits. And that means we put a little hash brown right there to mark the, the hash browns together. And that's how we remember the orders based on condiments and different things that we place on the plate it tells us what we're cooking. So I can cook with another person sitting beside me while I'm cooking, just marking plates. I can, um, I can, without saying anything, I can usually cook whatever he puts on that plate. So it's pretty neat. We can communicate without words. Because we're so busy, it just helps. It's pretty much the only way possible with the volume we do. Great question. So uh, the longevity of employees, you know, typically a uh, low end of the pay scale, you have trouble hanging on to people. Uh, I get the impression from your talk that you have uh, a lot of people with lots of years. Is that true? Or? We, we have a lot of people that have been here long. Uh, actually, one example, uh, and, and there are a lot more examples, but this is the most recent example that I have. A lady that worked uh, over, she's retired now, but she worked off exit 19, off I-85. 
Um, and she worked with us for 34 years and retired with $780,000 and she was a waitress. So after, now again, it grows really slow. It grows really slow. It grows really slow in the beginning and you would never think it would have happened to that, but after 34 years of time, there are other incentives like they'll add to the 20 year, 25 year mark, they throw like half your salary into the stock, add additional. And then at like the 25, there's different packages. I'm not sure exactly what they are, but there are incentives to stay longer. And um, it grows really fast. I know from the 10 year mark on, you get a career option every single year that's around $2,000 to $2,300. It's a stock option. That's, and typically, our stock has never gone down in 61 years. Our worst year ever is up 3%. Um, so that stock is pretty, it's pretty safe. And um, so, but it, it's growing and typically, historically, it's doubled um, each year. So then that, that brings the next question, if we're looking at your portfolio, I think you said on the five thousand, is, is a vast majority of it in Waffle House stock? It's, it is, it's Waffle House stock, yes. Okay, so you're all, you're all in. Waffle. I have, I have uh, most of it in Waffle House. I still do some on the side, like the, the pay, is, uh, if, you, if you talk to me later, I can kind of give you this, it kind of shows you the management, the district, and different pay levels. But I also save up on the side, and I, I'm doing a little bit of real estate on the side, and then I have the Waffle House stock is where the majority of my money is. Wow. But a lot, and a lot of that's options. So I put 10% of the paychecks into the stock program, and then I also have stock options. So the first stock option is a $14,000 stock option right now for a unit manager. At the 10-year mark, that's historically doubled and been worth, uh, that's when I was talking about when it doubles, it's typically worth about $28,000. Um, and then each time you get promoted, you get better stock options. Well, I was promoted to district too. After eight months, I made district. Uh, the district stock option is 43000 So that's another stock option I received. And then at the 10 year mark, that historically doubles, but it's still growing all that time. So those options I have are, are but, but a lot of it. it. It's all one stock. Yeah, it's still, it's, Rob, it's Waffle House private stock. Yes, sir. And it's, we, it was actually founded by two engineers from uh, Georgia Tech. And uh, one handled the operations side, the other engineer handled the real estate side, and then they grew the business together. Um, since then, they, they're actually still a part, they still have offices inside of corporate Atlanta, Waffle House, and they still show up some, uh, a good bit. Uh, they don't have to, they just love it that much. And then uh, the, the son of the restaurant side, uh, Joe Rogers, his son took over and, and helped grow the company tremendously. And now it's, a, it's on, it just started the third generation where Joseph III and uh, his two sisters are all involved with Waffle House, so we know that shows that it's going to keep continuing, so it's great. So is that where you got the yellow and black colors from George II? <laughs> Pro I bet so, uh, probably so. <laughs> and it also started from, uh, I believe it was called Tottle House, and one of them worked at a Tottle House when they were in college, or, uh, and then it changed over, and they, they started the Waffle House. So. Well, my other question was, the, uh, are all the stores the same size, or is there one store that's a lot bigger than the others? They vary. They vary in size a little bit, but they're pretty close. Actually, the reason, one of the reasons it changed from Title House is that they, they went and started the Waffle House, and what the difference is, he worked at the Title House, and, did, and he wanted to share the, uh, the stock with his people, and that's what he changed and made Waffle House do. So when he started Waffle House, he started sharing it with his hourly associates all the way up to, to the top ranks. So it's pretty neat. Um, but to answer your question about the size of the locations, it, um, they vary, they're pretty similar in size. Some of the newer restaurants are a little bit larger, but uh, also some restaurants are training restaurants to where we'll have classes in the back on Thursdays, and they make those a little bit larger in the back so we can fit more people. And uh, they'll watch videos and stuff their first day. Then we'll teach them how to call orders another day. And that kind of goes back into the people inventory. Of uh, The people supply varies. Very, it's a large variation from store to store. Depending on how good your manager is, that's how good you retain your hourly associates. If you're not doing well and you're not a people person, this is not a business for you. If you are very good with people, and you retain, I have one store that only only lost nine people in the entire last year of our associates, and that's 25 to 30 people at each restaurant. They only lost nine. That's a great manager. I have another restaurant that lost 52 people in a year. So, so, so the people supply it all it really depends on the manager and do your people like to work for you? Because 
they can go find another job somewhere. The, the, in the economy, they, in, especially in the food industry, it's a saturated market. They can find a job somewhere in the food industry. But with Waffle House, if they, uh, in anywhere, they choose based on their people they work for. Well, so with the, with the 52, what, what things are set in motion to replace that? To replace that? Well, we, first off, we try to we progress with discipline to learn and try to coach them to, keep the, to save the manager because maybe they're new or they don't realize what they're doing wrong. Usually it's how they speak to people. Um, usually it's how they speak to people and the people just don't want to work for them. And, um, but we try our best to coach them and keep them and they're given opportunity after opportunity, but eventually we do have to make an upgrade because it, it, it's hurting the business and it's hurting uh, these hourly associates rely on that manager for their livelihoods and we have to do what's best for the store and, and the hourly associates. If you're, I'm sorry. If you turn the store into a red indicator, it, 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 it does have an effect depending on how many people leave town, that kind of thing. So, recent with the Hurricane Matthew situation, we may have been able to keep a couple more restaurants open, but we had to close them down because of the people supply. We had people come in from other areas to help. But we also had to uh, use rest people from all, all the restaurants. And I think we kept 11 or so open in that market and had everybody working at those 11. And then as the storm got better, and I actually, my only job, instead of working behind the counter serving food, I went in cleaning these restaurants up to reopen them after the storm. And then as people filtered back in, we would open those stores back up as quick as we can. But yes, to answer your question, it does, it plays, a, it plays an effect on it. So who exactly uses the red, yellow, green? Uh, well, the indicator was it's FEMA. It's actually used by FEMA. Okay, um, just for the region where Waffle House are. Correct. And, yeah, I mean, it's, it's called the Waffle House Index, mm -hmm. is what the name and term for it is. And I think they came up with that in 2011. Um, but it, it's, yeah, FEMA uses it to determine how bad the storm is and how bad, it, I think the actual gauge is what the recovery, like how bad the recovery they're going to need. Like how many resources are going to be needed and stuff. Even if the hurricane is not in the area of the south, whatever, they still, FEMA still use you or do they use someone no, else? Well, they, yeah, they can't use it. They only use us where the wall passes are because that's how they, because they determine if we're open. So it's only based on where our restaurants are. In, in terms of um, inventory food purchasing, is that done centralized or is that done by each individual store on their own? Sorry, say it one more time. Like, like your food purchase, your your supply purchases mm -hmm. for for the food, is that done centrally for all Waffle Houses, or does each Waffle House store individually do their own purchases? So on a normal, are you talking about on a normal days? Yeah, yeah normal, 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 normal days we we actually have truck orders and we do uh, the manager fills those out once a week to order what they need, and then sometimes the free store or yeah, the one manager for like ten to essentially buy for everybody. So the manager for each store does that, uh -huh. and then they have district managers. But how our, our supply chain works is our managers actually work in operations every single day running a restaurant, so they cook or they expedite every day. The district managers are also in a restaurant running a restaurant every single day, so they work on a six day on, two day off rotation. So that when the manager's off, their days off are sacred. They don't even have to answer their phone. Their boss, the district manager, is actually running their days off. That way, they don't have to answer the phone or be bothered on their days off. So, so when the when the restaurant say the, man, the restaurant manager's off, the district manager will run that store and he would do the inventory for that one location. I, I, I would just think that you would gain greater economies of scale by purchasing for all your Walmart houses at a centralized location. Well, from one supplier. From one yeah, it's all from one supplier, but it, um, and we have deals worked out in long oh, in okay. advance. Right. But we just place the orders. Right. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Yeah, maybe I didn't find yeah. yeah, when I said play, I'm assuming that yeah, we save a lot of money. We're locked in for years with people. Okay. Yeah, they place their own order, but it does go to one supplier. Yes. Okay. You're not ordering this sort of unknown from this supplier. You use one supplier. Yeah, okay. Correct. But to add to Zach's point. Obviously, your your uh, network is dependent on your distributors, right? So you use their networks, their warehouses, their trucks to store the products for you, right? And, or you have your own centralized warehouse. It's through, it's through U.S. News. Right. So you basically are leveraging 
the volume that you use to get the economy of scale, and then you're using U.S. Foods Network to store right. and their truck. So really, you have the advantage because you don't have the cost for running your own warehouses, you know, being right. a perishable commodity. So that's right. Great. That's a great strategy as well. So definitely. And we yeah we don't have the warehouse. We use their warehouses that kind of thing. But we. Um, we have, we just have the back of it. Inside of our small Walker house, we have the walk-in coolers. So we have, we usually keep 12 to 15 days. 18 is a lot of days if somebody has that much inventory. Again, you want to kind of keep the inventory lower because you're saving money. You don't want your food, your, your product sitting there. So what's your average days of inventory? I'd say probably 15 days. 12 to 15 days. So, uh, two questions. Uh, uh, you get you get new food at a restaurant every week, right? And then and then is the is the amount that's ordered to replace the refill of the fridge, I guess, or the, the cooler, is that based on what's not there, or is that based on what you sold? Uh, is, there's a difference because if 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 I'm good at, at stealing something sausage, uh, it's, it's not going to be there. And somebody's going to reorder it. Versus if I look at your register and what was rung up and order based on that, well, then if something's stealing that number, somebody's stealing something, that number, the amount of sausages in the winch goes to zero. Right. So which do you use? We, we mainly use, so we have, a lot of, we have a lot of systems that we use every day to track the theft type of stuff, from what you speak of. Um, and the, we have what's called a two to two. Um, from 2 to 2, 2 p.m. or let's see, 2 p.m. to 2 p.m. the next day, we have uh, a, in our computer system, depending on how much food we actually pull out of the commissary to the floor, is how we keep track of the theft. Um, and then we can look at, and there'll be a number, and our goal is to keep, right now our goal is 29.5%. Um, so the number, if it's over 29.5, then we pay some Pay like pay more attention, and a lot of it is speaking up using uh, awareness. Twenty nine point five percent of revenue. Correct. Okay, so if I'm if I'm stealing something cheap, uh -huh. I get away with it. At times, I'm sure they get away with some. I mean, cause you know, of, I, I I did a, I did a couple talks for uh, uh, golf clubs, and those aren't those aren't a branded, right? And and they don't have there's no connection between ordering a steak and one steak coming out of the freezer. Right. And I just assumed that all chains were different in that, you know, if you rang up a, a whatever, it, it knew that you must consume that. And it sounds like that connection does not exist. Yeah, at times they can get they can get away with a smaller item. We do have cameras that focus, they, they shine right down the cash register, and we probably have about seven in each restaurant. Um, <clears throat> some of them watch, we have like one on the parking lot, then to make sure we don't have a lot of damage in the parking lot, if something happens, we can catch people. And we also have a lot inside of the restaurant. So one shines directly on the cash register, and others shine uh, where the food is and where the customers like out at the door. Uh, we also have systems in place where the back door is always tagged, so they're not allowed to go out the back door, at, especially when the manager's not there, because managers work first shift every day. So we tag the back door so the food can't go out the back door, and then we have the cash register, one shine on each of the doors of the cash register, and then two just kind of spotted around the restaurant to see what's going on inside. And that helps if, if, if we have, and we, we're supposed to look at it regularly. Um, if they don't, then they can look at it when those numbers aren't matching right, and they know to look at it to catch people. Um, okay. <laughs> A lot of the, the people that run the best food costs typically are the best the managers that show that they care about their people. Um, you'll find that our associates actually want a boss. They want leadership. And they want uh, to have the tools that are necessary to operate successfully. Um, people, the most, the easiest way to frustrate your cooks is to give them dull knives. If they have dull knives, not only is it a safety issue because you're more likely to cut yourself with a dull knife than you are. The sharper knives cut a lot smoother, and it's a lot easier to not cause harm to you. Um, but yeah, so I, I hope I answered the question. <laughs> actually, actually, you did. I'm going to take that tool analogy back to work. Give, give them <laughs> yeah, so tools. It is, good. It, 
it, it helps to get along. Like you want to get along with your people, but at the same time, they do like to have a boss, and someone they can look up to. And when I was, the, I think the reason I'm most successful with Waffle House is because I care about. I actually truly care about my people. I want to help them. You can't help them by giving them money, but you can help them by listening to them if they have a problem. I might not be able to fix the problem that day, but I can. It, it, a lot of people in, in the in their lives, they don't have somebody that necessarily, and some, some of them, a lot of them do, but a lot of them don't have people that care about them. So if they come to tell me something, the least I can do, it costs me absolutely nothing except my time, is I can listen to them, and that shows that I care about them. That's usually how I run the, run the best food costs. And then also awareness. Like, I look at the numbers. We look at the numbers daily. We look at the film daily. And, um, and, and when they, uh, the awareness is a huge deterrent because if you're asking about it, saying, hey, my food cost is a 30, things aren't going right, and, and, and you just talk about it, you don't even have to be mean when you're talking about it. It just raises awareness so they, they're watching their portions. Because a lot of it is not only, it, it, it's not, everybody doesn't steal necessarily. A lot of the inventory can be waste. Um, say they're scooping out hash browns and a hash brown is supposed to be an even scoop. Well, a lot of them will scoop it out and it's, a, it's a, this tall, it's a double hash brown and it's just, it's just one scoop, but it's, it's really a double hash brown. So the, it, depending on how your cooks are with their inventory is a big deal. So you want to coach portion control as well. So, and also some of your inventory would have to be like someone returning food. I mean, you know, like you just said, the hash brown, but suppose someone returning, right. that's yeah. the way that's part of, that falls into that. If the order's messed up, mm -hmm. if the order's messed up, we'll have people call in and they'll return food. And again, the main thing with that is the, cook, the grill operator has to sign it and they have to turn those, those messed up orders into the manager. That way we know what's going on. And if you have a lot of food coming back, then it's a whole other coaching issue in itself. Um, <laughs> but, but we do have that sometimes. You don't take returns, but you're going to throw it, right? So. Yeah, I mean, yeah I mean, somebody returns and we can throw it out. So it's pretty much it's trash. You can't reuse the food. That's why I like to have an open grill where I see exactly what you're doing. That's right. <laughs> it's the truth. Any other questions? No, I think we've got a few minutes, so I, 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 I think you did a great job, so... Yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to kind of summarize a little bit, you know, especially for the students here that are going to be studying supply chain or working in supply chain or going to start working in supply chain. I think a few of the takeaways here was, you know, Waffle House is the mission is more from a social standpoint to make sure that people are fed in times of, you know, they are always open and they have a place to eat. But one of the things I think uh, is most important is they take care of the people, right? So you take care of the people and then the company takes care of itself, the revenues come and so forth. Um, from a manufacturing perspective, I think there are great takeaways, right? So first is planning, right? Everyone works here in manufacturing some way or the other. Um, and, and so they, Waffle House has planning and then they have contingency planning, right? So I don't know how many of us in manufacturing go through that process. We probably talk about it, but we don't really go through that to the extent we need to, right? Um, so that's, that's a great lesson. And then the other thing is performance-based metrics, right? So you measure the performance of the store and then you compensate or, or reward the employees based on how the Know, how the company does. So I think that's another motivating factor for the employees of Waffle House to be there and be part of the team and be there for so many years. Right? Right. So it helps them with the buy. Exactly. So I think it's all about communication, collaboration, you know, the people skills and, and just being, I guess, just nice to people. So I think from a manufacturing perspective, we all work in a very, I guess, uh, uh, stressful and, and, you know, really fast-paced environment. But at the end, it's all people driven. So I think that's a great takeaway for us. So thank you so much. Thank okay. you. Thank you.